David, can you just tell us your name so we have that on? Uh, David Phillips. And David, how often do you cry? <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends on the week. Um, actually, on my way here, I cried. Sometimes when you're in your most vulnerable situations and Adele hits, she really hits. So you know in Guardians of the Galaxy when Groot makes a tree ball around his friends and Rocket's like, Groot, no! The episode where Ben and Leslie get married. And I picked up the phone and I realized she's not there anymore. I probably cry once every six months if it's a bad six months. In 2016, when I received a video message of a moment that I probably shouldn't have missed, I remember these things because for three years, I kept a record of every time that I cried. This is your spreadsheet. So you guys all read my spreadsheet. I crunched the data a little bit. So the majority of these were reactions to media, TV shows, movies, podcasts, some articles, um, and about 37% were things that were actually happening in my personal life. So as I've been looking into this, one of the most interesting facts I've come across is that a lot of people consider tears to be the only bodily fluid that doesn't gross us out. Snot, earwax, <laughs> spit. All the other ones. All, the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> All gross. All gross, but we yeah. we don't have that reaction to tears. Why do you make the spreadsheet? Um, when I cry, it feels like I've become a different person because in my normal life, I'm very calm and collected. I feel like I'm in control. And I think most of us take for granted that crying is something that humans do, but I've never felt like I had a good grasp on why we do it. I would weirdly find that crying during swim practice was really therapeutic. So I just like cry a little bit of my goggles and then I rest on the wall during the interval and then I just like literally would empty out the tears, put my cap back on and just like keep swimming. I have enlisted the help of Tai Li Wu, a master stop motion animator, to help us explain the anatomy of the lacrimal system, which is what makes us cry. It's alive! <laughs> We're gonna bring Alex in and show him how it all works. All right, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, so the main lacrimal gland is here on the upper outer part of the eye socket. That gland releases tears that travel across the eye, washing any irritants away. And then when we blink, the liquid gets pushed into two tiny holes near the corner of the eye. And if you look really close, you can see them. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, I can now. You do? It's tiny right there. Yay! Can you show me the other one? Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. You can see the hole. I actually can see it. Oh my God. So our tears drain into our nose and that's why your nose starts running when you cry. When the lacrimal gland is producing so many tears that they can't drain fast enough, they spill over onto your cheeks. And that's crying? That's crying. Wow, so it's just like this overflow of excess tears. Exactly. Wow. And we share this anatomy with a lot of other land animals. It evolved way before humans did. And I found a clip on YouTube that I really want to show you. Oh, buddy. Did those onions get to you? Oh, buddy. So this is what happens if you cut onions by a cat, which is not a particularly nice thing to do. But what's unique about us is that humans are the only animal that cries tears of emotion. Really? Yeah. So there's some point in our evolution that our lacrimal glands became connected to our emotions. And I really wanted to know how that happened. So I called up a Dutch psychologist named Ad Vinger Hoots. Great who name. is, yes, who is considered the world's leading expert in crying. If you watch infants crying, then you see that they put pressure on their eyeballs by squeezing actually the muscles around the eye. <laughs> and our hypothesis is that, so there is a kind of mechanical pressure that is put on our eyeballs and that is detected by the sensory endings of nerves who stimulate 
the, the release of tears by the lacrimal gland. And would that be why we have tears when we yawn as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so the idea is that the babies would have been screaming to get care, that vocal signal, and then it would have come along with that, these tears. Yes. So this vocal signal co becomes connected to the production of tears. And well, that vocal crying is of course very important in the early phase when a baby is not able to move towards someone. There might be also a downside to it because it's not just the mother who, who becomes attracted by the sounds of the crying. It can also be a predator. So there's also a, a, a risk of, of, of this making this uh, noise. I see. So maybe there was a survival advantage to a child who produced more tears as opposed to more vocal crying? Yeah, yeah, that's our idea, yeah. Mm. So what I'm getting from this is like, over time, crying became a way for us to reach out for help. Now you're saying that tears are essentially like a more subdued way of expressing those same things. Exactly. Humans go through this really long childhood where our brains still have to develop because we've got these giant brains, they take 20, 25 years to finish forming. And I think that's why this crying persists into adulthood for humans, is because we're vulnerable for longer than other species. Mm. I mean, kids are in their parents' house for 18 years at least. Um, <laughs> or they 25. Or 25, whatever, no judgment. It was the sad, helpless screams of infants that likely linked emotions to tears in our ancestors. As adults, our emotions are more complex, but they still trigger the same signal. Um, I was walking to get groceries one day and um, I got a call from my grandfather. He's sort of like another parent to me. I lived in his house for a while growing up and uh, I started crying. I didn't really let on, but I was like, oh wow, I really miss, I really miss you. I'm really touch that you're thinking of me and calling me, even if there's not much for us to say. One of the things that we hear a lot is that people feel better after they cry, and that crying is cathartic. Um, I've looked at some of the research on this, and it seems like even though a lot of people report that crying makes them feel better, they haven't been able to find any sort of physiological mechanism that would explain that. So I am on my way to meet with Dr. Mina Dasari. She is a clinical psychologist, and I sent her my spreadsheet in advance, and I'm curious to see what her analysis of it is. Thank you. All right. Do you think crying is healthy? I think crying is healthy when done in moderation when it's used as a form of emotional expression, but in conjunction with other coping strategies. Crying as a release of emotion, as a way of self-soothing, and then moving on to different forms, I do think can be healthy. He is so cute. He's the sweetest. And they're like constantly wearing tie-dye, which is their thing. All the time. Yeah. yeah. My nephew was born in 2014, and my niece was born in 2016. Sure. And you can see those in my spreadsheet. Absolutely. Um, feeling like I was really missing some of those key mm -hmm. moments, their births, some of their birthdays. And then my sister would send me videos of them. Hey, happy birthday, Auntie Jossie. Happy birthday, Auntie Jossie. <laughs> happy birthday to you. And those moments were just like, oh. You know, like, I should be there. You longed for that connection. I did. Well, I think that's what I was struck by when reading your entries, is the big theme to me seemed human connectedness. And there were sort of two experiences. One was the expression of that human connectedness, either love or affection, um, but also the loss. My mother died when I was 13 years old, and, and my father didn't quite understand me. And, uh, and I didn't understand him. And, and so uh, I, I cried a lot of sadness. There was a lot of sadness in my life. Oh, Father by Madonna. I'm thinking of my mother basically through the whole song. The last day that I saw my mother alive was Mother's Day. You know, my inner child's mind, I just feel like wounded. And it's always that part that 
makes me feel like she's wounded too. What happened? He's sad. He's sad? Yeah. Oh no. That made me sad. <laughs> he wants his mama. Oh. Say mama. So I showed that clip to the Dutch psychologist Ad Vingerhoots, and he said that it's actually pretty rare for a child that young to feel empathy to the point of tears. But as we get older, it becomes more common to cry, not just for ourselves, but because we see others in pain, and especially for women. Across the board, women and girls score higher on tests of empathy than men and boys. And that might partly explain why women cry more than men. In a survey of 37 countries around the world, women consistently reported crying more often than men. And for me, crying can feel almost contagious. Each of these clips is from my spreadsheet, and they show that there was a consistent trigger that made me start to tear up. 70% of the time, it was when I saw another person crying. And I just remember, like, crossing the finish line and being so emotionally vulnerable and so emotionally dead. And then the plan was everyone's just going to meet me back in my apartment. And so as I was walking, um, one, of my, one of my best friends, he came and, and found me. And, and, and I, again, I started crying as soon as I saw him because I, I was just so glad that he was there. And I was so glad, like, somehow he knew that I needed him. You got me. <laughs> it's like, if you cry, I'm going to cry. That's amazing. I think the most mysterious tears are the ones that come when something positive is happening. So I wanted to see if the team had the same reaction that I did to wholesome videos from my spreadsheet. Joss is having us watch some videos uh, that she sent to us. Are you about to make me cry? That's that depends on you. So here's the file. So Dropbox link. I don't really know what to expect. I think she wants me to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm really scared. <laughs> Okay. Oh my god. That's only the second one. That's crazy. I have goosebumps. Look. Oh. Was it Singapore or Thailand? That's too much water for that plant. The Thai commercial where the guy is going around doing kind things for everyone in his community. It's funny that that was on my spreadsheet because when I started researching this, it turns out that it's a clip that psychologists use to study the emotion of being moved. Mm -hmm. There's a study that asked people to track when they started crying while they were watching that video. And you can see that around the two minute mark, there's this big jump. Oh, when I know people what that start is. Crying. What do you think it was? It's little girl in her uniform. It's gotta be little girl. It's gotta be little yeah, girl. Yeah, that's the moment. That's the moment. <laughs> that's when the character realizes that the girl he's been donating money to <laughs> has begun to go to school. And this finding comes from a research group that studies an emotion that they call kama muta, which is a Sanskrit word for moved by love. So if you've ever seen something that made you sort of reflexively put your hand on your chest or get chills or goosebumps or tears, they say those are all symptoms of this distinct emotion of being moved by love. So their findings suggest that you're likely to experience this emotion when there's a sudden intensification of a communal relationship, when people feel themselves suddenly closer to each other. And I think of it as kind of like surprise intimacy. So we think that surprise is a really important aspect of that emotion. Because if, if you just have this relationship and there's like this really tiny change, which is just happening over several days, for example, maybe you would feel a bit happier, but it wouldn't be this intense feeling um, that you would have just in the moment. What? Are you serious? Are you serious? What does that say, babe? What is that? <laughs> when people say um, positive tears, tears of joy, that always seemed a little bit 
not right to me. It just seems like there's something more going on there than just joy or happiness. Yeah, we agree that it often is occurring together with sadness. And, and that's basically also the beauty of it, I guess. It's uh, because you often have this contrast. So imagine a typical situation would be if you uh, reunite unexpectedly with, uh, with a loved one you haven't seen for many years. So that had to be this kind of loss, this background that it would occur against. Would you consider yourself someone who cries less often than most people? I wouldn't know. Like, I, I'm not sure how frequently people cry, but I was saying... I can tell you that. Okay, please do. <laughs> so studies suggest that in Western countries, women cry on average two to four times a month. Wow. And <laughs> men cry about once every couple of months. Yeah, I would cry about three times a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. But they're, they're good ones. They're good yeah. ones. Well, the good news is that there is a study about non-criers, and it found that non-criers don't differ from criers in their well-being. They don't seem to have more depression or anxiety. So this notion that crying is necessary for mental health, that it's a necessary release, that doesn't seem to be true. The director of the debate team I was on in college passed away, and all the alums came back for a funeral, and everybody was crying, and I noticed that I was not. And it was the first funeral I'd been to, and I realized that that was different, and I felt like um, I had to take measures to signal to others that I was still affected by it because I wasn't showing the most obvious marker. There was a survey back in the late 90s that asked a bunch of countries around the world how often the people there cry. And what they expected to find was that the countries that had lower standard of living, the countries where they rated themselves with lower well-being, and the countries with higher depression rates would be the ones that cried more. But that's not what they found. The dark blue countries are the countries that reported crying the most frequently and the light green are the ones that reported crying the least. So you see here, we have three countries in Africa, we have Nepal. These are countries where the researchers would have assumed that the people there would have objectively more reasons for crying. But what they found was that it was the happier, wealthier countries that cried more. And the variables that correlated with crying frequency were things like the level of civil rights, the level of democracy, extroversion and individualism. And so what this study suggests is that crying, at least on the international level, isn't about how much distress a population feels. Rather, it's about how much that population feels they have the freedom of emotional expression. I think there's a special comfort in crying publicly. It's nice to be around other people and know crying is a part of your day, just like your commute or your lunch break. It's just, nope, it's cry time, it's cry clock. evolved as a signal to others that we need their help in order to survive. But for adults, crying can be a message to ourselves if we pay attention. I think about him a lot these days. Uh, he's getting older, I'm getting older, and, you know, time's not stopping for anybody. It's a matter of, of, of going through life's atrocities for me, and, and yet I came out on the bright side. Your tears are a signal that you're seeing something important to you. And the memories and values that start pouring out of your eyes, they can be surprising. There are a lot of things that uh, push my buttons, but what's actually coming out could have been building up for years. Dr. Vinger Hoots had a neat way of putting it. He said, apparently there's... There is some knowledge in my body that I'm not aware of. I tend to say, tell me what makes you cry, and I will tell you who you are. <laughs> No! 